everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us for Refresh Your Resume webinar. This program will be presented by Career Services. I will be your presenter today. My name is Shannon Gallo. I'm the Manager of Career Services here at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Thank you once again for joining us today. I look forward to talking with all of you over the next uh, 55 minutes or so. I appreciate you joining us. I think we have a lot of things to cover, but I look forward to um, going over all of that with you. Um, we'll go ahead and start things out. This is your quick introduction, a few housekeeping items. We ask that you do remain on mute with your video hidden during the session to provide for a higher quality recording. Um, mentioning recording, we are going to share the slide presentation, a link to the recording, as well as handouts with our participants along with an evaluation that you'll hope you'll take a couple of minutes to complete once today's program has ended. So the topics that will be covered today, of course, the big one, resumes. Uh, we will also talk about professional references sheet. We'll talk a little about cover letters and thank you, follow-up letters. We'll talk a bit about completing employment applications and online um, career profiles, and then at the end, I will take some questions and hopefully provide some answers to you. I would like to thank Nikita Cassidy. She is the Data and Administrative Coordinator for the Career Services team here at CUNY SPS. She is assisting uh, behind the scenes with today's webinar. Please feel free to reach out to her via the chat to send your questions or comments or any other things that you may need during the session. Um, and I look forward to speaking with all of you. So without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with Refresh Your Resume. So starting out, one of the most important things that we like to go over about resumes are the types of formats. Uh, there are two primary uh, most common formats for resume. The first of those is the reverse chronological format. And this is pretty typically what you'll see with resumes. Um, these are where the experience is listed in order from top to bottom, starting with the most recent on top and the least recent on the bottom. These types of resume formats focus on job titles and organizations. And they highlight career progression, loyalty to employers, and your most recent accomplishments. As I said before, these start with the most recent or current things on top going to least recent on the bottom. So this is um, probably the most common format of resumes. Another somewhat common format for resumes is what we'll call a functional resume or a competency-based resume. And this type of resume focuses on your skill set, your qualifications, and your achievements. This type of resume format can really highlight fine-tuned professional skills, as well as some of those intangible skills, human skills. This type of resume, we always like to mention it here at CUNY SPS because it can be very useful for a career changer or someone who is entry-level or someone who happens to be re-entering the workforce after an absence. The reason really for that is that this type of functional resume focuses on your skill sets and your qualifications and the impact that you've made, even if those things were done in a different field or industry than where you're looking to move. It's a nice way to highlight for a prospective employer the skill sets that you have um, rather than having your experience listed in a reverse chronological order where they would see the types of things that might be the most recent but not the most relevant. There are finally um, a third type of resume format that is a bit of a combination of a functional and reverse chronological where you still list your experience and you include job titles and organizations and dates 
and it still highlights career progression, but it also has more significant focus on qualifications and skill sets. So now that we've gotten through the types of formats of resumes, I'm going to go through and talk about a little bit sort of what I'll say are the basics. And this is something to keep in mind whether you are making updates or changes to a resume that you've been using for quite some time, or if you're creating a brand new resume from scratch. We suggest that when you get started on your resume, you do not do so with a template. It's very difficult to make changes and updates to a resume if it is in a template. So our office suggests starting from scratch in Microsoft Word. A couple of notes about font. Typically, you should use between 10 and 12 point sized font. Anything smaller than that gets to be a little bit difficult to see. Anything larger than that gets to be a little bit distracting. So we typically suggest between 10 and 12. Make sure that you're using the same font throughout the document from top to bottom. And keeping that in mind, simpler is better. So a couple of suggested fonts that tend to work well for resumes, Times New Roman, of course, Arial, Verdana, or Tahoma. You should use black text only on your resume document. And finally, if you're keeping with the same font throughout and being very simple, it's important to keep in mind that you can use bolding, italics, and underlining for emphasis. And that is what we suggest doing on your resume rather than using different fonts or different colors. Now we'll move into a little bit more broad suggestions on retooling or building your resume. It's important that the document is consistent and clean throughout. This means maintaining the same margins throughout the document. Each subheading on your resume, whether it's a job title or the name of a college, a location, a date, these should all be done in the same way, lined up and have the same emphasis. So that means if you bold the name of one employer, then you should bold the name of every employer that is listed. If you italicize the location of your college or university, then you should also italicize and align the location of your work history. Typically for consistency purposes, no graphics or photos should be used on resumes. Um, this is something that comes up occasionally as more and more, uh, more resumes might be included with, photos might be included with resumes overseas, but typically in the U.S. for job seekers, it is not suggested. Finally, bullets and using bullets on the resume are a great way to keep it neat and easy for someone to read very quickly. So let me pause for a moment. I'm going to show you um, a couple of resume examples just to highlight what I'm talking about when I mention having a clean looking and consistent document. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see on here the resume sample that is on your screen. Um, as I mentioned before, we will share these handouts with everyone afterwards. So feel free to just sort of watch and absorb the content as I'm going through. As you can see on this particular document, each subheading is bold, all caps, and underlined. The different degrees that the person is earning are all italicized. They've used a bulleted font, and throughout the document, all of the bullets are aligned. They are including the names of organizations, and those all look the same. They have the location. All of those look the same. Here is a second resume formatted slightly differently, but alas, still everything is done pretty much the same way. The bullets are aligned. All the different sections look to be done in a consistent way. 
This particular sample is a functional resume. And then that's moving into cover letters. Okay, so now let's move into the actual content of the resume and the word choice. Uh, one of the most important parts of your resume are your verbs. Um, a couple of important things to keep in mind if you're talking about a current position, something that you're doing at the present time, that should be described with verbs in the present tense. If you're talking about anything previous, any of your jobs that you held before what you're doing currently, those should be past tense. You should try to make sure that each of those bullets on the resume start with what is the strongest action verb. So when you can still maintain accuracy of what you're describing on your resume, but there is a word that might be a little bit stronger, that's what we suggest you use. But at the same time, you want to try to avoid repetitive words, phrases, or sentences, especially right in a row after one another. The idea is that when you're using that bulleted format, when you're going down the resume, the person gets a clear idea of your impact, the work that you're doing in your job, but they don't get tired of reading the resume because they're not reading the same thing over and over. It's also suggested and important to use descriptive words, but don't overdo it. And like I said before, maintain honesty and accuracy. So now I'll talk a little about the connotation of your resume. What kind of a impression does the document evoke to a reader? This is where you can really think about putting yourself in the shoes of the person who is reading your resume. What is a positive way to describe something versus a negative way? How can you evoke a favorable impression rather than a negative impression? So for example, if part of your work as a client service rep is to handle customer complaints, and instead of describing it as dealing with angry customers, you might come up with a phrase to describe it that means the same thing, but is a more positive way of describing it. Perhaps instead of deal with angry customers, you could say build customer solutions or offer customer solutions, something like that. If you're talking about solving a problem or providing a solution, that's a more positive way to describe resolving customers who are complaining. It's also important to, wherever possible, add quantifiable details in your resume to show scope and to add credibility. This means add numbers, percentages, dollar figures certainly can be very powerful in your resume. If you're describing, uh, say you were working with vendors and you were getting lots of price quotes and analyzing how your company would be able to get the best product at the best price. Um, and maybe you found a way to save your company money. If you can put a dollar amount on something like that, it makes a big difference to prospective employers to see the impact that you've made in a quantifiable way. But here is where you also need to make sure that you're being accurate and honest. So talking more about adding ways to make yourself stand out and show your impact, it is important to try and make sure that your resume is achievement and results oriented. Make sure that you uh, describe any expanded responsibilities that you have taken on. Make sure that if you are promoted or move to a higher level position, that you indicate that on your resume as well. 
It's also important that you add those little things here and there that might fall outside of your typical job description, but are nonetheless important to really show the impact that you make in your organization. Describe special projects that you've, over, that you've overseen. Make sure that you are sharing ideas or solutions, as I mentioned before, that you implemented and how those things made a difference in the organization. Did you save your company money? Did you make a process more efficient and less cumbersome? Did you maintain a stronger team? Did you help train new employees who were hired? Anything that you've done that is managerial in nature, even if your position is not technically a managerial position, those are important to indicate as well. That shows where you have been able to stretch, where you have been able to perform above where your level has been. So this might mean if you sit on the search committee, if you help to, like I said previously, train a new employee, if you're one of the more senior members of your team or your unit and you find yourself being that go-to person when people are not sure how to get something accomplished, make sure that you indicate those things, that you take on an informal leadership role. If you participate in any budgetary activities, if you do staff scheduling, those kinds of things really can show the difference that you make in your work, even if they're not technically part of your job description. So what I'm getting at is think about your resume as a way to highlight your achievements, your results, and your impact, rather than a way to highlight the day-to-day -day things that you do in your job. A couple of other thoughts about resumes before I move on. A summary can be very, very helpful. As I mentioned before, when I was talking about functional resumes, you may want to consider using a summary or profile statement on your resume. This is very useful, especially for someone who is looking to make a career change and might be trying to highlight transferable skills on the resume. If you find a way to summarize how all of those skills and experiences and maybe your degree and your education make you a strong qualified candidate for a different type of career, describe that in the summary. This could also be seen as what many times we might call our personal pitch. This is where you describe who you are, what you do, and what you want to do next. Finally, your summary statement can also be an objective, especially if you're looking to make a career change or to grow within your career, you can explain that word for word, seeking a career change from such and such position to such and such position. That way you're able to set the tone for the person reading your resume based on how you want them to approach the document when they are reading it for their open opportunities. I'll also mention a little bit about what I'll call buzzwords or your keywords. These are the types of things that will be very specific to your industry or even your organization. And this is where you need to be very careful with acronyms. Sometimes an acronym that is second nature to you in your work may not be something that is familiar to someone else, particularly if they're in a slightly different industry or type of organization. So if you are using acronyms, make sure that you write out what those acronyms mean at least once on the document. When you're trying to come up with the best keywords to use on your resume, take some cues from job postings. If you're reading over job listings and you're thinking, gosh, I know I can do this position, my experience is just a little bit different. I will use the example of a person who works in a customer service role. If they are applying for a client service role, consider changing up the resume here and there to mention the word client versus the word customer. Finally, make sure that the skills and other keywords you're including on your resume are relevant and current. 
And this is where it's important to be understanding of your particular field, particularly when it has to do with business or tech. Um, things are changing so very rapidly within the tech and data fields that if you're using a certain program, make sure that whatever you're including on your resume is the most up-to-date and current one. The other thing that I'll add when it comes to these keywords is this is where it's very important that you have the most relevant, up-to-date keywords, taking your cues from job postings. Because if your resume is submitted for any online applicant systems, which we'll talk a little bit about later, it's important that those types of things match up with whatever is in that employer's system. So before I move on, I'm going to bring up Actually, let me do one more slide here. Okay, so before um, I move into our other sections, I did want to say a couple of things about the overall impression of resumes and share some final pointers about the document. Um, I worked for some time prior to coming to CUNY SPS in the staffing and recruiting industry. And these are some of the things that my colleagues and I used to do um, when we were evaluating candidates and screening resumes. Um, I always suggest that once you have your resume all ready to go, you've gone over it and over it, you've spoken with a career advisor, you've asked a friend or a family member to take a look, print it out for a final review and really go over it closely on paper. There's something about having that paper that really can help you see if there are spacing issues, if there are margin errors, if there are word choices, if there's words missing, those kinds of things sometimes can be a little bit more clear if the document has been printed. Go over it out loud, read it out loud. This is something that I um, actually used to do from when I was studying journalism in undergraduate. One of my professors always suggested that before you uh, send a story to editorial, read it out loud. And something about reading it aloud and understanding how the words flow can help you get a sense of what the overall impression is of that document. Is there some, are there some words that could be flipped around? Are there some verb tenses that are off? Sometimes reading it out loud is one of the best ways to find those little things that can make a difference. Read the document from bottom to top, especially if you're using that typical reverse chronological resume format. The idea is if someone is reading your resume from the top to the bottom, they see the most relevant and most current and highest level skill sets and experiences on the top going down to the bottom where they see the least recent, least relevant, and least important skill sets at the bottom. I recommend, as I said before, if you're working on the document within MS Word um, or any other program that you might be using, I'm understanding that Canva is growing in a bit of popularity for resumes. Um, I'll reserve any judgment on using Canva, but whatever program you do choose to use for your resume, I suggest saving that document as a PDF. Um, many times that's the only way to be certain that if a person is looking at your resume on a tablet or a smartphone or a PC or a laptop or a Mac or whatever their device is, a PDF is likely to, is least likely to have the format messed up when they're reading it. Finally, if you are deciding to use any hyperlinks on your resume, if you've got an e-portfolio that you're including on there, if you're adding a link to your LinkedIn profile, make sure that you check and double check that any hyperlinks are working properly. I do think that hyperlinks can really add a lot to your resume, particularly in certain fields where um, prospective employers may not be as familiar with your work or the organizations where you have worked. Um, hyperlinks can be effective for that. Just make sure that they are working properly. And finally, LinkedIn. I mentioned LinkedIn and adding your profile link to your resume. I think that is a wonderful idea. Just be careful because if you are actively applying for jobs and sending your resume out, 
and you include the link on your resume, make sure that your LinkedIn profile is also up to date. Um, make sure that all of those documents mirror one another and that if an employer is looking at your resume and they click on your LinkedIn profile, that they will be clearly seeing the same individual and vice versa. Uh, before I move on, I'm going to open those resume. I'm going to open those resume handouts and just just go over a couple of things that I've been talking about here. Uh, I talked a little bit about verb tenses. Um, as you can see here on this particular resume, this person previously worked in this position. So they've used past tense, strong verbs. They've provided detail explaining which databases were used. They have um, shared information about how they were doing things. They talk about reports. They talk about data entry. And notice there's no repetitiveness here, but they've got some really strong explanations using those action verbs. This section on this resume, I'll just take a moment to, um, I had mentioned how important it is to Make sure that your resume has quantifiable details that can really add to the impact that you're showing. Um, this particular section here talks about uh, strong action verbs, created, published, and managed weekly digital content. Specialized, and that talks about how timely it was weekly. Specializing in health, fitness, and lifestyle. That provides a little bit of context and detail. And through that, they talk about increased web traffic by 350% within the first six months. So that should tell you that this person is not just saying, we made a difference because we did, we created, published, and managed digital content. I was in, I made an impact because I increased our web traffic by 350% in only six months. And that really shows the impact that this person made. And it doesn't take up a lot of extra space. And I think that it's memorable and it sets that person apart from other candidates who might not provide those quantifiable details. I also thought I would highlight on this particular resume, the summary statement. Um, it's brief, it's descriptive. Um, but it also is memorable and it sets the tone for the reader and the rest of the document. Lastly, um, I did want to remind everyone that you're welcome to send in your questions to the chat. Um, Nikita is uh, helping us out behind the scenes and she'll be happy to take those questions and share them with me to go over at the end. Uh, one, other, one other thing that I will mention um, on these documents, as you can see here, this particular one only indicates Brooklyn, New York. It has a phone number and an email address. Uh, typically, it is not necessary to include the full address on your resume um, at this point, so that's important to note, particularly if you're looking at fully remote positions. It may not make sense to include really any location. Um, that's up to you, but certainly I thought it was worth mentioning. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move through. Okay, so I'll take just a quick minute to speak about something that I think is um, not talked about too frequently related to job search, but nonetheless important, uh, your references. And this is something that um, should be kept separately from your resume and cover letter documents. Typically, it is suggested that if you are embarking on um, an active job search, and even if you're sort of passively thinking about a job search, it's best to have three professional references, if possible, at least one of those a former supervisor, and at least one of those someone who is working with you currently or within your school community currently. So if you don't necessarily have three work-related professional references, um, it could be a good idea to uh, check with an instructor who has been 
um, obviously impressed with your work, um, who knows you well, they could also reference you. Occasionally, particularly if you work in a client service or consulting related field, um, occasionally a client or vendor um, or someone you have worked with on the other side of things could be a good reference for you. Um, an important note about the references sheet is this is really something that you only need to provide upon request. And what you want to do is include the person's name, the organization in which they are referencing you from, um, their accurate phone number, and their email address. Even if they are no longer at the organization where you worked with them, you can still include them as a professional reference. There's no reason why you should not. However, anyone you are planning to use as a reference, make sure that they are aware, especially if you are actively job seeking and sending out their information to prospective employers, keep in contact with them. They want to be able to help you in an effective, positive way, but they're not able to do that as well if they're not well informed. Make sure they understand the types of things you're applying for and that you've provided their information. Okay, so now I'll take a couple of minutes and move into um, what I think is one of the most difficult, yet can be one of the most crucial parts of an effective job search, and that is cover letters. Cover letters should typically be targeted and specific. So not only does that mean they should be targeted to the organization and uh, the job itself, but they should also be specific to how you meet the organization and those job requirements. So as I say here, it's not a great idea to use a form template. Does everyone check and read cover letters closely? No, absolutely not. I think that this is very much something that depends on the organization, the industry, the particular recruiter or hiring manager, and the job itself. But my advice to you as a serious job seeker is if you're doing a cover letter, and there, especially if a cover letter is requested or required, make sure that you are doing it targeted and specific. It takes time, but it's well worth the effort. You wanna make sure that when you're looking at those jobs and applying for those positions, you take time to cite the job requirements that you see as being particularly important for that job and make sure that you list not only what those job requirements are, but how you're qualified for them. What have you done in your previous work history that, that can show them how you're qualified? Make sure that you take a moment and show enthusiasm for the job and awareness of the organization. And this is something that you just can't do if you're submitting an application with just your resume. In your cover letter, you can talk about what it is that gets you enthusiastic about that organization. What are you passionate about? If it's a nonprofit organization and you have a particular interest or connection to what their mission is, tell them, explain that to them. That can make a big difference and that can also make you memorable to the organization if you're compared to another applicant who either did not send a cover letter or did not take the time to really be thoughtful and direct. Your cover letter is also an opportunity to help them understand who you are as a person and what your work personality is like. What are the types of interpersonal skills that you have? Um, what motivates you to be successful? Doing cover letters in this way can also really help prove you're a serious candidate for a position. If you take the time to make a targeted cover letter that directly relates to that organization and job, they're going to take you a lot more seriously than a person who they can obviously tell has used a form template and simply changed the organization name and the job title. Lastly, all of this going into a cover letter, I will describe that, I will explain that it sounds like a lot, and it is, but it's also a really good way to help you prepare for a future interview. If you're taking that extra time to go through that job closely and really think about how you meet their qualifications, 
number one, that's going to make you more likely to get the interview. And number two, once you do get the interview, you will have already done some homework on what's important for that organization to know about your skill set. It also tells you that if you did take the time to do a targeted and specific cover letter, there were probably some things that you mentioned in that cover letter that appealed to that organization. So it's a good sort of foundation for how you, pre you present yourself in future interviews. So I'll take a quick moment and go over a couple of things in cover letters. Okay, now this is an interesting format for a cover letter. Um, it starts out pretty traditional talking about the type of position, um, the type of industry and the organization. This particular cover letter outlines a little bit about what the person is doing currently in school, what they're studying, how that relates to the job search and what this position is. They also take the time to actually bullet those three or four responsibilities or qualifications that are listed in the job description that they possess. And this is really where they're taking that time to really highlight how they're uniquely qualified for the position. Further down in the document, they include a little bit about what is so great about the company, why they're applying for that position, what interests them about it, what makes them, you know, think positively about the organization. This might also be a great place if you are a referral to mention the person who has suggested you apply for that organization. The cover letter can also be the right place to put, um, to answer questions that may have been in the job posting or to clear up any uncertainties that might exist on your resume. You could include things like your work availability. If they ask for your salary history, if they, um, which actually in New York, they're no longer allowed to ask for that information in the job description. It's only something they can request when they're making an offer. Um, other things that you might wanna add here when you're available for work, if they have asked for any other specific details in their job posting, make sure that you include those within your cover letter. Uh, and here is a more basic, simple type of cover letter as well. Um, we provide these examples to um, our webinar attendees as sort of a guide, but we hope and anticipate that you will sort of put your own touch on these documents, but this should give you a good start. Okay, don't forget to send those questions in. I'll address them at the end. We're working our way there. So now I'll talk another form of job search related correspondence, and that is follow up thank you letters. Something that I've often um, talked with our students and alumni about is, should you always send a thank you letter? Um, and the answer is an absolute yes. Even if it is a quick 15 minute phone screen conversation, my suggestion is typically that if you don't send a follow-up thank you letter and another candidate does do so, if everything else is equal, you don't want that little piece of the process to be the one thing that puts that person ahead of you. Um, if for no other reason, that's why they're important. Um, typically, email is the best way to send a follow-up thank you letter versus snail mail. I think so many people are working hybrid or remotely that sending snail mail would not only take a long time and run the risk of getting lost in the mail, um, but I just think that email works just fine. It gives a person a record of you that's digital that they're able to save. Um, and for many, many reasons, email typically works best. I also suggest sending that follow-up thank you within 24 hours of the interview itself. They may be speaking with many, many other candidates and you wanna make sure that you stay top of mind, certainly. And a few notes about the length and content of your follow-up thank yous. 
this is your opportunity, much like a cover letter, to address any concerns or go over anything that may not have come up in the interview conversation that you think is really crucial to go over. I also think that if you were interviewing and they asked you a really complicated, difficult question and you kind of froze up and you don't feel like you answered it as well as you could have, but after you logged off of that Zoom, you realized what you could have said and should have said. This is something you might consider including in your thank you letter. Refer back to that conversation. If that interviewer seemed particularly excited about something you discussed, bring it up again. Again, that keeps you top of mind and makes you memorable. Another important part of your follow-up thank you letters can be the section where you say next step. You can agree to follow up with them. You can suggest that you are very interested. You can make it known, especially if you haven't been as clear in the interview itself. You can say, I am reiterating my strong interest in the, in the position and I know that I am a strong candidate and I have a lot to offer your organization. It's a great way to sort of put that final sell of yourself and your skills and your qualifications for the organization. If you've met with multiple interviewers, if you've maybe attended a group interview or a search committee is hiring for the position, I know that happens somewhat regularly in the higher ed area. Um, if possible, if it is a long, complex interview process and you've been there for a couple of hours, I would suggest sending a separate follow-up to each of the interviewers. But if that is not possible, you can send it to the person who was the search committee chair or the main primary contact person, and then cite conversations that you had with the other people who were involved with the process. A general rule of thumb for these follow-up thank you letters is that if it was a short 15-minute phone screen, then you can send a shorter, brief, not as complex thank you letter, but if it was a third round group interview that lasted for several hours, then the follow-up thank you letter will probably be a lot more complex and a bit more lengthy and detailed. Lastly, if you're not interested in the position, if you do the interview and there are things that come up that you realize gosh, this is just not the right fit. It's not what I expected. Um, or for whatever reason that comes up during the interview, you realize that there is no way you're going to be moving forward with the process. It's still important to send a follow-up letter. You just never know what the future holds. And it could very well be that if you're not a great fit for this position down the line, this person might have another opportunity come up and you want them to think of you. It's possible that someone in another area of that organization or a colleague of theirs will mention that they're looking for someone and you could be a great fit for that. So you just never know what the future holds. And I think that it's best to, you know, really use interviews and use these types of correspondence as a way to build those connections and build your brand and create those relationships. And here is a sample of a thank you letter. As I mentioned before, this is, you know, can be somewhat simple. You're kind of thanking them for talking with you, taking the time to meet and discuss the organization and the position. Talk a little bit, as I said before, really sell yourself and how you qualify for the position and what makes you interested. Cite things that you talked about during the interview. Reiterate your passion and interest. Um, and then finally, as I said before, if you have decided that you're taking yourself out of the running for the position, this is an easy place to put it, but also a very gracious way to do so, um, to make sure that you're sort of leaving this um, person within this organization with a very favorable impression, even though the position is not going to work out. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, just talk a little bit about um, 
online applications and applicant profiles and things like that. Um, this can certainly be what I'll call a very tedious part of a job search process. Um, when you're looking online and you're applying for jobs, particularly, um, I'll use the example of hospitals. They typically um, have you know, their full applicant tracking systems in place and pretty much any position you wish to apply for in a hospital setting, you need to go on their, their applicant site, you need to fill out your profile completely. If they give you the opportunity to upload a resume, wonderful, make sure that you do so as a PDF, but also if you're copying and pasting that document, include that in the online profile as well. If they give you an option, I suggest, if possible, doing both because you just don't know for sure if that particular recruiter or hiring manager prefers to read within the online profile what you've copied and pasted or if they want to look at the resume. Pay attention to details. Make sure that you're being honest. Make sure that you're being forthcoming and you answer all the questions. This is where your resume and that references sheet I talked about can really come in handy because this is a lot of information you're going to be inputting to these systems that you want to make sure is accurate. As I mentioned before, I always suggest uploading that resume as a PDF. If they give you options to include other types of documents, maybe an e-portfolio, a writing sample, a cover letter, all of those things are important to include in these online profiles. And finally, along these same lines, make sure that you are regularly updating your LinkedIn. I had mentioned that previously that if you are embarking on an active job search or even a passive job seeker, it's really important to make updates and changes to your LinkedIn profile, um, just as it is to go onto these application sites and update those profiles regularly. As I had mentioned earlier, um, I worked for a couple of years within staffing and recruiting. And I know as when I would log into applicant tracking systems, there was a way for us to filter results by most recently created or recently updated profiles. So that is why I always suggest to candidates that once you go into those applicant systems and you create your profiles, Make a note for yourself to go in every couple of weeks and make some minor changes. Maybe update your, your resume slightly and add a new document to your profile. Maybe change around the order of the bullets on your copy and pasted resume. If you have taken a couple more classes since you last filled out the profile, update those things. Because it's likely that people who are reading through those applicant profiles will be able to filter as well. And they're gonna be more likely looking for people who have recently su submitted a profile versus people who submitted a profile a long, long time ago. And that can be the case when people are simply searching on LinkedIn as well. So that's just important to keep in mind that it does make a difference if you're updating those profiles regularly. So I will be moving ahead um, to address and answer some of your questions um, here in a minute. I did want to just mention that um, CUNY SPS, if you have not heard about it, we have um, a really wonderful e-portfolio program available for all of our students. Um, some courses, some majors and some courses require e-portfolios, but we think it's important to suggest to students because even if you are not doing so for academic purposes, an e-portfolio can be a wonderful way to extend how you are branding yourself for your job search. Um, these e-portfolios are available to any student at CUNY SPS and they remain yours. Once you've graduated, even as an alum, you have the ability to update and share and all of those things of your e-portfolio. If this is something that you would like to learn more about or you're interested in creating an e-portfolio, I highly recommend that you reach out to the team here at CUNY S. They are wonderful and amazing, and they do a lot of things to really help you set up a really nice e-portfolio. 
And this can also be something that you add to your resume, the link to your resume or to your LinkedIn profile. So it's just another one of those documents that you may want to consider creating as part of your job search toolkit. So this concludes the content part of today's webinar. I would like to take a couple of minutes to answer any questions that might be coming in. Um, this is your opportunity. We've got about seven more minutes left. So I would love to um, answer questions about anything that I have not covered. Um, as I said before, we are uh, planning to share the slide deck, the link to the recording, um, as well as the handouts that I showed during today's webinar. We also um, will hope that in exchange for those documents, you'll fill out our webinar evaluation to let us know what you thought of today. Um, okay, let's see. I see some questions coming in. This is great. This is a great question. Uh, this one is based on that follow-up thank you letter. Um, what if your first sort of your first engagement with a company or organization is an interview? Is it still a good idea to send a thank you le letter? Absolutely, very much so. Um, you know, it it might depend on the type of interaction or engagement, but if it was anything substantial, if you spoke with them for you know ten or fifteen minutes on the phone. Just a quick message, you know, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I enjoyed our conversation about such and such opportunity at your organization. Um, from what you said, it seems like I would be a great fit and I'd be happy to learn more about the position. Simple as that. A couple of sentences just to sort of keep yourself top of mind and help them understand that you know, you are truly interested. And I, I think, as I've said before, it makes you come across as a serious, informed job seeker. Uh, there's some questions. I mentioned LinkedIn a couple of times during today's webinar. Um, yes, Career Services does provide um, support for students and alumni if you're looking to create or um, enhance your LinkedIn profile. I would suggest um, you're looking at the um, the programs that we have coming up, but certainly I would suggest that you log into your CareerLink profile and set up an appointment. We can definitely go over your LinkedIn with you individually. Um, we also can do a number of things and help with resumes as well, but I think you've all taken a really big step by being here today and um, learning about resumes and cover letters and all of the other types of job search toolkit document. Uh, here is a question. Uh, what if you don't know much quantity to include on your resume? That's a great question. Um, I know I was talking a little bit about um, how useful it can be to include um, numbers, percentages, things like that. Um, even if you don't know the specific numbers, you can certainly put a range. I also think that it can still be effective if you are able to say, uh, for example, uh, even some types of information that you may be able to find that might not seem like it can have an impact. Um, this particular one served as a vendor representative for Brooklyn Imports, coordinated product information and distribution for 75 field representatives and major accounts. So just adding that, how many field representatives were in the organization makes a big difference because if that 75 wasn't there, the reader could think it was five field representatives, 20 field representatives. Sometimes just a little number in there can make a big difference. The other thing that I will add is if you don't have a lot of those quantifiable details, maybe you don't work in a field that really is based too much on metrics. I think it is a good idea to make sure that you're very focused on those action verbs and providing detail wherever possible. Um, as an example here, this talked about um, not only did they collect and analyze trade show and conference data, they did this primarily in Excel. This gives a clear picture of what this person was doing in this particular job.
Okay. Um, I see a question here. What if my resume is longer than two longer than two pages? This is a great question, and it's something that we hear pretty regularly. Um, I know for many many people in many circumstances, a lot of people have said one page resume at most, and I am here to tell you that that is not always the case. Sometimes it is impossible, particularly if you have experience if you have college degree or degrees, if you um, are anything other than a brand new entry level person, it is possible that your resume goes beyond a page. I think it's important to keep in mind that you don't wanna go back too many years, particularly if the experiences from those time periods are no longer relevant. And you wanna make sure that the skill sets and things like that that you're including on your resume are current and relevant. If your resume goes beyond a page, it is okay. I think sometimes that can be difficult, but it makes sense, you know, make an appointment with a career advisor and talk with them about, hey, here's my resume, here's what I'm looking for. These are the types of jobs and skill sets that are required for this particular field. What should we leave? What should we take out? It's definitely a difficult decision, but certainly, I think the one page rule is not so important anymore. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of other questions. I'm so happy to see this. Is it important to have a LinkedIn profile? Yes, I typically suggest that even if you're not going to actively engage on LinkedIn, having a profile set up where you can connect with people and people can connect with you at a minimum, I think is very useful. It also makes sense because even if you're not actively job seeking, sometimes your LinkedIn profile can be a good way for you to sort of keep an inventory of what you're doing in your work, what you're doing in school, the types of people you're coming in contact with, because you never know how circumstances could change. And you might, um, you know, one day wake up and really need to have that strong network in place and sometimes having an active LinkedIn profile is an easy way to do that. Uh, I'm seeing some questions about handling gaps in work experience. Um, these are great questions. Uh, sometimes life circumstances get in the way of work circumstances. And if that is the case, I typically suggest as long as you're comfortable making a mention of what you were doing during a certain time frame, so that the employer will sort of know from the get-go what you were doing during that time frame. If you, um, a question that I hear quite regularly, um, a person may have left the workforce and been taking care of children or caring for family members for a number of years, you can include that on the resume as well. If um, certainly when you're doing those kinds of things, they require skills that you're developing and honing. And so it's important to list those things as well. If you volunteered, if you have um, been active in community organizations and things like that, if you've done training programs, things like that while not working, include that on your resume. Um, certainly if there are extenuating circumstances, I would suggest that you talk with a career advisor about the best way to um, go about covering up those gaps or the best way to go about disclosing them. Um, but it certainly is important, I think, to provide some context about what was going on if you have a gap in employment. Um, I'm realizing that it is two minutes past 1.30. Um, I am so appreciative of all the great questions that have come in thus far. Um, I'm I've enjoyed talking with everyone today. I um, I hope that all of you have gotten a lot out of today's webinar and that um, you'll be contacting us with your revised resumes to review. Um, just a reminder again, we will be sending out the slide deck, a recording, and the handouts with the evaluation and we hope that you'll take a couple of minutes to review all of that and fill out the evaluation and um, i look forward to working with all of you and i hope that you've enjoyed um, 
today's webinar and gotten some ideas and tips about refreshing your resume. Have a good afternoon, everyone.